When I was in high school, um, one of the subjects that I hated, absolutely hated, was history. And um, yeah, I fought through many a term, and the first chance I got to drop it in grade 11, I said, that's the first subject I'm dropping. But I don't think it was the subject, I think it was the teachers and the impression they gave of it. So in grade eight, my first teacher was um, actually our school principal at the time. And he taught very passionately, but his spit flew passionately as well. So he would walk around and preach to everyone, right? And the spit would just be flying, you're just like. <laughs> and then he was, my, he was my history teacher for two years. And then after that, we had a history teacher who kind of um, read everything to us. Right? And so everything was this monotone reading of everything. Every now and then, they'd crack a joke that no one would catch, because right? you're so bored and you're just ready to sleep. So after that experience with history, I said, no, I'm going to drop it. The first chance I get, this is out. History is out. And then when I studied at NETS, I remember in our second in our second year, I'm not sure if it was second or third year, I saw one of the subjects we we're going to be doing that term is church history. I thought, ah, I thought I left this in high school. Why is it here again? And um, Simon, this 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 amazing lecturer, as, as some of you know him, um, they're not with us anymore. Simon Gillam taught us taught us uh, church history, and when he taught it. History became my favorite subject. I remember one of our projects, we got to act out some of what had happened in that period of church history. And so students were just, they were so excited. This is the first time we have a project and everyone is excited about it. The day, normally the day that you hand in projects, people are, you, you see people come to school, eyes red, knowing you haven't gotten any sleep at all. You're thinking about where you have to put this reference and that reference and hoping you do it right so you don't lose marks. That morning, people were just like, I'm so, everyone's talking about their part. And you're like, just wait until you see my part. And so we all get passionate about this. But now we love history because history was presented to us in this beautiful way. And we're able to engage with it and interact with it. And I thought to myself, man, if I had known history was this cool, I wouldn't have dropped it in high school. All right? and, I, and I wish now, being taught by this man, that, that I had history all the way through to grade 12. In, in modern church, there are a lot of things that, because of the way they're presented, because of the way that we've seen them, uh, we, we shy away from them. Uh, there are a lot of things as we've been reading Acts, all these things that are, that are good and that are biblical, that you hear in Acts, and, and because of the, the, the negative connotation we've seen and we've experienced, we're kind of like, no, that's not part of what God is asking us to do. We've, we've seen um, people speaking in tongues, and because of the way that it's been abused now, we're like, we don't need any of that. And today we're talking about something that is probably just, just as controversial we're going to be talking about prophecy, and we're going to be looking at uh, the story in Acts 21. So if you want to turn there with your Bible, I see a few people with Bibles. Those things still exist, those books that you, yeah. If you don't have that, you can also pull out your phone or whatever it is that you have and uh, digitally flip there. Uh, so Acts 21, we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 14. Who gets there faster? Is it the phones or the Bibles? All right, all right. Old school's always the best. <laughs> so this is, this is Paul. Now they've, this is Paul's journey to, to Jerusalem. It says, after saying farewell to the Ephesian elders, we sailed straight to the island of Kos. The next day we reached Rhodes and then went to Patara. Then we boarded a ship sailing from Phoenicia. We sighted the island of Cyprus, passed, passed it on our left, and landed at the, at the harbor of Tyre in Syria, where the ship was to unload its cargo. We went ashore and found the local believers and stayed with them a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go on to Jerusalem. When we returned to the ship at the end of the week, the entire congregation, including women and children, left the city and came down to the shore with us. There we knelt, 
prayed, and said our farewells. Then we went abroad, and they returned home. The next stop after leaving uh, Tyre was Potolemus. I like these words. <laughs> these places have such amazing, amazing names. Where we greeted brothers and sisters and stayed for one day. The next day we went to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist, one of seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. Several days after that, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt, and bound his own feet and hands with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But he said, why all this weeping? You're breaking my heart. I'm, not only, I'm, I'm ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. When it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. And this is an interesting passage. We hear Paul receive this prophecy. And, and as you read the text, the prophecy is inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to these people. And Paul just keeps on going to Jerusalem. I remember first reading this and thinking, was the prophecy not important enough? Is, is Paul disobeying God? And these are questions that you might have as we read this passage. But to, to understand why Paul did what he did, we need to understand what prophecy is, first of all. First thing is, prophecy is a God-given spiritual gift. It's from God. Now, the way, the way it is presented to us um, in modern church uh, a lot of times it's not from God at all. Right? It's, it's people using the gifts that they've been given, or sometimes the gift that they claim to have been given, to boost themselves, to lift themselves in status, in, 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 to, 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 to fill their pockets, and to gain power. But prophecy is a God-given spiritual gift. In Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 4, it says there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There's a variety of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Prophecy is a spiritual gift, and it's given by God. And every believer is given a spiritual gift so that, so that in our own way, in the way that God has gifted us, we would... We would uh, build one another up in the church and spur one another on to go out and do God's work, to make him known to the world. Each one of us has a spiritual gift that in that specific way lifts up and glorifies God. And that's what the gifts are for, and prophecy is one of these. So it's from God. Another thing about a, a spiritual gift is what it's used for. It says in 1 Peter 4 verse 10, that God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. That their purpose is to serve the church and to serve God's purposes. That that's what, that's what prophecy is for. Now, I, I'll never forget this one time reading, not reading, watching this, this, this guy on, on TBN. And TBN is, yeah... There's, there's a few good people, there's a lot of nonsense, right? And this guy comes on, and I, I won't name him, but he comes on and he says, there are people out there whose businesses have not moved forward, and you are praying for God to enlarge your territory. And he's about to reference Isaiah 54, verse 3 and 2. And he says, I can give you a word of prophecy. But as these numbers say, 54, verse 3, verse 2 and 3, if you can give a pledge of $54.23, I will personally give, 
give you the word that God has given me. To enlarge your territory, to grow your business, to grow your family, whatever it is that, 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 that the devil has been holding back from you. And he's saying, I'm going to use this gift of prophecy if you, in your faith, can plant the seed of $54.23 U.S. <laughs> yeah. Not a cheap seed. But these are the kind of things that we hear. Um, another small way that this happens is when um, single people sometimes claim to have the gift of prophecy where they walk up to someone and they said, God said, you are my wife. Or God said, I actually heard that someone said this to me in, in, in the strangest language. The Lord told me, you are my portion. I know, your portion is somewhere else. <laughs> but this, these are the ways that the world has tainted these gifts of God. That we hear things like this and we say, we don't want to hear anything about that. And they're all these spiritual gifts that are misused. And every spiritual gift, in, in, a, in, in, in the gifting that God has given us, every single one of us has the temptation to fall in our pride and to use it for ourselves. And, that's, and, and this, this what we see with all these prophets coming up left, right, and center and telling people to do all these crazy things. It's pride that has eaten at their hearts and that has led them to, to, to seek their own gain rather than lifting God up with their gifts. So what is prophecy? Prophecy is, hearing, is, is basically hearing a special message from God and sharing it with the people God intended you to share it with. Right? And it's... It's a, it's a mix of two things. It's a mix of foretelling, which is reminding people of what God has said in his word, and foretelling, which is receiving a message from God about the future that's meant for a specific person. And what we have today, why we have a lot of these prophets running around is because a lot of people have taken what, what the prophets were in the Old Testament and have pasted them directly onto themselves today. Now, in the Old Testament, we... We, the prophets have much more authority than the gift of prophecy has right now. And, and one of the reasons is, is that today we have the Holy Spirit. As, as a believer, when you give your life to Christ, when you, when you, when you turn from your sins and repent and, and, and make him Lord and Savior, he sends you the Holy Spirit, who is God himself and who reminds us of all the truth, who teaches us all things as we search through the scriptures, who leads us daily. In the Old Testament, they didn't have the indwelling of the Spirit like that. So all of the people would hear from a few people. They would hear from the Levites and they would hear from the prophets or, or whoever God had ordained in that time to be the leader. And God would speak directly to that person. That person would transmit the message to everyone else. And when the, when the prophets spoke, God gave them the Old Testament prophets. God gives them the, the authority, and what comes out becomes scripture. And it was God's word, his authoritative word. It's not the same in the New Testament. We have the Holy Spirit. And yes, the, the gift of prophecy is there, but it's not authoritative the way it is in the Old Testament. There's no, there, 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 there's, there's no prophecy now that people can just kind of add on. Some people do believe they can, and there are believers, and there are churches that do believe that when you speak, when you speak a word of prophecy, that it has the same authority as the word of God, and that is not true. Because right at the end, there's a warning that nothing should be taken away or added to the word of God. So it will not have the same kind of authority. So we have Paul coming, coming to these two places. And the first place he comes to, they tell him, they, they give him a warning. Don't go to Jerusalem. They're basically telling him that danger is waiting for you. They don't say anything specific. So I think they didn't hear anything specific. They just know, Paul, please don't go there. Danger is waiting for you. And Paul... 
keeps on going. He says, I need to go to Jerusalem. God has told me I need to be there. I am heading there. The second one speaks even more specifically and says, this is the way you'll be tied up. And as he gets to Jerusalem, they have a time where, where, where he speaks with the, with, with the council of churches there, and it's, it's so evident that he needed to be there. It was God's mandate that he was in Jerusalem. It was God's plan. But then he also is captured. And it starts there, he's arrested there, and it starts, it begins a series of trials. He goes from one person to the next, and he's going up in, in, in the authority in who he's coming before to be tried. And, it, and, and, and that actually started Paul's opportunity to share the gospel to people in these ascending levels of authority. Paul knew this was God's call. And as I read, because one of the things I was thinking was, why would they have, why would God have given this prophecy? Why? And it seems it was, it was something to prepare Paul for what was coming. It was it, was, it, it wasn't God saying, don't go there. He's saying, this is what awaits you. But Paul already knew this. And, and this, is, this, is, this is the thing about, about prophecy. And even as you look at the Old Testament prophets, we look at someone like Isaiah, right? There's this aspect of foretelling, reminding people of God's word, and foretelling, telling of what's going to happen. But a lot of, most of what all the prophets were saying in the Old Testament is reminding people now, with, with, with Isaiah, he was speaking to, to, the, to some of Israel before they had been captured. And he's saying, remember what God said. Remember before you entered the promised land on those two mountains where he gave the blessings on one and the curses on one? Remember when he said that if you, if you were faithful and if you obeyed him, that he would keep you and protect you and make you fruitful and disease wouldn't touch your people and the armies would protect you from the armies? And then he says, but you have turned away from him. And remember what he promised, that if you turned away from him, if you worship these other gods, if you did what all these other nations around were doing, that I will give you over to those nations. And Isaiah has this, this, this awesome picture of the two where he's telling them, he tells them to repent, and at the same time he's telling them that Babylon is coming to take them. And then later in the chapter in, in Isaiah 53, he tells of the Savior who will suffer and die for us. But everything is rooted in God's word. Prophecy does not, because, because it's, 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 it's a spiritual gift from God and God is a God of order and what's in his word and, and, and what his spirit wills to do will be in line with one another. And Paul, as he's going on to Jerusalem, remembers what God told him when he saved him. That you will be my apostles, my apostle to the Gentiles, but you will suffer for me. I will show him how much he must suffer for me. It's what God said to Paul. So Paul knew this was coming. This, 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 this persecution was part and part of the package that God gave him. And you can see Paul throughout, throughout his ministry, he lives this he, like he knows it. Well, further in the, in the chapter, there's, some, there's, there's a, a, a story of Paul being shipwrecked. And everyone is freaking out, and he's fine. Right? He knows the destination that God has sent him to. He knows he's going to get there. He's like, I'm not going to die. We're not going to die. We're going to be fine. Right? He's talking to sailors who know the sea, who know the storms. And he's living in this confidence because he knows what God has told him. This, at some point, they're collecting firewood and he gets bitten by a snake. And he just shakes it off and continues. I'm not going to die. 
But this is, this is suffering. I, I think of, of being in that situation and having a snake hanging off of your hand. In my mind, I'm thinking, yo, if I don't get antivenom soon, I'm dead. <laughs> but Paul knows. And he doesn't, he, he doesn't wallow and, and feel sorry for himself. Say, oh, I got bitten by a snake and I've been shipwrecked. And God, I've been doing all these things for you. And, and I got stoned by people this one time. And people have tried to kill me multiple times. I've been arrested multiple times. He understands that it's part and parcel. And so when they're telling him this, when they're telling him that, don't go to Jerusalem, you're going to be arrested, he's thinking, yeah, no, no, I know about this already. Right? This, is, this is what I'm supposed to do. So how do, we, how do we test and see whether prophecy is true or not? In this day and age where this person is a prophet and that person is a prophet, I actually know a friend of mine who just became a prophet last year. I had all these, these stupid questions to ask him, but I held back. I thought, what if this is from God? I had all these sarcastic things to say, but I didn't. But the truth is, we're living in a day and age that God talked about, that there'll be false teachers everywhere, false prophets everywhere. How do we tell who's really from God and who's about themselves? Well, one of the things is um, rooted in the fact that every single one of us is supposed to be hearing from God daily, right? That we have access to God the Father. Because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, we can speak to him. He, he reveals things to us. He says, you're no longer slaves. You are friends. Because I tell you my secrets. I tell you the truth. And that's one of, one of the biggest protections against any of these false teachers is us spending time in God's word. So that as we hear something, we can say, this is consistent with God's word or it's not. And we hear thing and something and right away we go, this doesn't sound right. This is not from God. And a lot of times, most of the time actually, people are fooled and it's their fault. Yes, these, these false, false prophets are are being deceptive, and, and yes, they know. They know how to craft words and, and how to, to, to make it sound like what they're saying is true. But we have the word of God, and we have more access to it now than ever before. When you don't understand things, you can go online and read commentaries, accurate commentaries on God's word. We have it on our phones Do we use it? With all the access to it, do we read more? Or is it like the rest of the internet where we have tons of information, but actually as a people we get dumber and dumber because we never commit to putting it, any of it to memory because we, have, we, we take it for granted because we have access to it. And that's what we've done with God's word. We have access to it. I'm sure most of the people most of us here have more than one Bible in our house, right? I think we have something like six or seven, a lot of Bibles. Has that increased how much we read? And if we did, if we truly spend time in God's word, he would speak his truth to us. He would, through his spirit, protect us, protect our hearts and minds. As we go to the, to, to the scriptures, we, we, we ask, is this consistent with God's word? But another thing we need to ask is, does this prophecy glorify God or the person speaking? Does it glorify God or the prophet? And as you go, if, you, if you go back to the Old Testament, the prophets were asked to do some really, at times, embarrassing things. 
Some were asked to, to, to walk around naked for years. It's not about the prophet, it's about the one he's prophesying about. It's his words and his truth. But when we hear the word prophet today, when you switch on TV or, or listen to radio, they're even on YouTube and Instagram, right? They have these live sessions. Every now and then I go on just to see how crazy they get. They're really crazy. But they're everywhere. And there's, there's people everywhere. And, and, and you just see donate this or fund here or come be at my church. I have yet to see a, a prophet on any social media be about Jesus Christ and lifting him up. Be about speaking the truth, the truth of God's word to the people. But if we know who our God is and what his plans are and the fact that every single one of us are made to glorify him and we can use that to test whether or not this is from God. What do we do with our gift of prophecy? I know there's some here who have that gift, and maybe because of the way it's been abused, you shy away from it. It is God-given, and God has called you to use that gift to, to lift up the church. So if you have that gift as, as you hear something, because sometimes God tells you something, to tell someone maybe it's not the right time. Maybe you need to hold that back. I have, I have people as I was wrestling with whether or not I'm called to ministry who, who didn't say a thing and just said that we, we see, we can see with our human eyes why God would call you to ministry, but we can't say that. You have to hear from God. I think as, as, as with any gift, we need to exercise wisdom and submission to God. That if you have this gift, that when you hear something, you spend time with God. You ask him, God, is this the time to speak? God, am I to speak? How long do I wait? Do I not speak at all? That every gift is from God and should be used for him. So of course, in our exercising of that gift, we need to submit to him. But we need to, to, to embrace and be grateful to God for the gifts that he's given. If you have the gift of prophecy, be grateful to God for that. I mean, he's put something, he's, he's gifted you with something to draw people to him. He's gifted you, he's given you a tool to be part of his mission. So cherish that. Let's, um, let's bow our heads in prayer. And um, first, if, if we need to, to ask God for forgiveness for, for not spending time in his word, for not being discerning because we've made that choice, let's do that now. Let's also pray that God would give us wisdom to see in the sea of, of all the false prophecy and all these false teachers to protect our hearts in him. And let's also pray for God to give us wisdom on how we are to exercise that gift, if that's the gift that he's given us. Let's pray. God, we thank you as the one who gives all good things. And um, we thank you for, for, for calling us as your people, as your church, as this machine to go out and to reach this world for you. Thank you, God, that you've given everyone gifts, that all who believe in you have been given one gift or the other. And God, thank you that, that, that you would use us, a sinful people, who deserve none of this, but by your grace, you give us these gifts and send us out. Thank you, God, that, that you also give wisdom. So I pray that you'd give us that. Lord God, may we go to the scriptures and search them thoroughly 
and read them and meditate on them and, and, and memorize them and delight in them. God, that as, as the lies that come from the enemy would be blocked because of, of, of how much your wisdom has fortified our hearts and minds in you. Jesus, we thank you that uh, you lead and you guide. And Holy Spirit, um, we, give, we give all of our lives to you. And we ask that you lead us and guide us in the use of these gifts that you have given so graciously. Thank you, God, that you've called us and lead us to, to, to draw people to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship.